What's up guys? We got a killer Q&A coming up because these questions are amazing. So post more down below and let's get started. Home gym, no bench. Will the floor press build massive pecs? Yes, my friend, it absolutely will. In fact, there are some people who the floor press is more difficult than the regular bench. Me being a perfect example. Basically, assess your anthropometry. Are you able to touch your chest on the floor press? If that's you, you might actually get more out of it in the sense that it'll feel heavier. So disadvantageous leverages can be good for building mass in that case, all right? It's similar to how tall guys, they complain they don't have the shortest arms for benching, but it might actually be a good thing for building up your pecs due to increased range of motion. Now, even if that isn't you, don't stress it. It's still a good range of motion, okay? It might be a little bit of a partial, right? But that can always be corrected by adding push-ups on the side, okay? Or you can even elevate yourself a little bit so the range of motion is deeper. So grab some mats, lie down on them, your arms will come down lower. It's as simple as that. And the final benefit is that the floor press, you're on the floor. So you got a super wide base. And for many people, this will actually be safer on the shoulders compared to these super narrow benches. So if for whatever reason you don't want to buy a bench, you just want to do it off the floor, I see no problem with this, man. Just do floor press, okay? You can do it with dumbbells and a barbell. You can elevate yourself off the mat. You can even do floor press with bands and chains. Lots of variations that exist. And then you could supplement it with some push-ups for a little bit more range of motion and to get that stretch reflex effect. So I see no issue with this whatsoever. You are going to make all kinds of gains. When isolating your arms, you recommend a slow tempo and feel the muscle being worked or a fast tempo. Well, my friend, I would recommend that you keep it controlled, but it doesn't have to be super slow, okay? So when you're doing your curls, flex, go back down, okay? Just control it. Don't be swinging weights around, okay? Don't be going like mega, mega fast like you're doing dynamic effort training, but keep it controlled, but Moderate tempo. I think that'll work best for most. Or you could go really explosive on the way up, so fast, and then slow the eccentric a little bit. But these super duper slow reps were taking forever. You're like, okay, you're just taking your sweet ass time. You don't have to do that, okay? As long as the repetitions are controlled and you're feeling the exercise, I see no issue with it, okay? But like I said, you can also use super fast reps too. There's a reason why plyometrics work, okay? So if you want to do super fast extensions or curls and all that, that's going to be fine, okay? Just make sure that you're consistent with that tempo and that you're still inducing progressive overload over a long period of time. Not because of the increased speed, but because you're actually getting stronger, okay? Yeah, Alex, what are your thoughts on landmine press? Keep up the good content. Well, thank you, man. My opinion is that the landmine press is an amazing mass builder and a raise your general strength, particularly in the shoulders and upper chest. I know when I did a lot of them, my upper chest definitely got thicker, okay? The only con that I noticed is that it didn't give me carry over to the overhead press. This was a while back. I was trying to raise my OHP, right? So I did landmine pressing for months. Got way better at it. Got way better at the variations. Didn't have the best carryover, okay? It's a different movement pattern. The strength curve is different too, especially uh, depending on your height. And if you're using uh, one of those machines, landmine machines, or if you're shoving in the corner of your gym, okay? So you gotta be mindful of that. Just my experience, okay? But for you, it might be the opposite. You might actually get a bunch of carryover, okay? And it might become one of your favorite lifts. I don't know. I say experiment, but if you're into bodybuilding, Definitely make use of it. It's a great exercise. Hey Alex, I did leg extensions and started getting knee pain. I stopped for over a month now and I still have knee pain. I still do squats though. What's going on? Okay, leg extensions this is the problem. We have a quad dominant epidemic. Too much quad work, not enough posterior chain, okay? I don't recommend leg extensions. I've never done them in my training. I might have tried it just a few times, but I'd never, ever, ever work out with leg extensions. It actually promotes knee stress rather than preventing. Now, if you're gonna do that exercise, use very, very, very light weights. That's not a movement to go heavy on, okay? So go stupid light. Get some squeezing in and use super short rest intervals. You don't need heavy weight for this lift, okay? But I would say avoid it altogether. Instead, you should be doing leg curls. Not necessarily a machine because that could also cause you knee pain. I still can't use that machine. It gives me props, okay? But if I do it with the ankle weights or bands, now it's a natural movement pattern according to your own anthropometry. And that can actually be beneficial in reducing injuries. So if you're going to isolate like that, I'd recommend leg curls, glute ham raises, uh, even Nordic curls, okay? Or the, the um, inverse curl machine. Okay, don't do leg extensions. And I think that'll help you a lot. Now, you probably snapped your shit up, right? If you, it's been a month, you're still getting pain. You, you probably injured something doing the leg extension. So I'm sorry to hear that, but I'd recommend that you take up walking with ankle weights. Start doing the leg curls with the ankle weights and the band leg curls as well. And do some sled pulls as well. And hopefully that'll fix the problem. And even do some uh, band terminal knee extensions and sumo stomp. So sumo stomp, you take a band, you put on top of a power rack, you shove your feet in it, and you stomp down, okay? So try those out, man, and I hope it helps. What size box for box squats would be best for a six-foot man, 12-inch? I've heard using a bench is too high. 
12 inches is going to be way too low for you. Like that's something that I would probably need. Okay. Cause I'm short. The taller you are, the higher the bench could be. It's just the way it is. So you can probably get away with using a bench at your local gym. Okay. Uh, depending on your anthropometry though. I, I don't know. Some guys are six feet, but they're longer in the legs. Others are longer in the torso. So it depends on your build there. But I would say, uh, try to 15. If that's a little bit too high, do a 14. And I, I don't think you'll have to go lower than the 14. Okay. But the taller you are, the higher the box could be. Okay. It's, it's not about the absolute height. It's relative to your individual build. Okay. So try out the benches. If that doesn't work, you can get those plow boxes and do it off that. Okay. And that's usually how I used to do my box squats back in the day. Hey, Alex, I'm a martial artist. I was told not to do squats because it would negatively impact my flexibility. What would you recommend as a replacement? And what other exercise you think will benefit a fighter? Okay, well, I don't see how it would negatively impact your flexibility. Have you seen Olympic weightlifters? They're doing ass to grass, deep squats, and they have some of the best flexibility around. Okay. And I know for myself, when I used to do a lot of squats back in the day, that's when I was the most flexible because that's actually what it is. It builds flexibility with weights, okay? It's one of the best ways you can do this, real talk. I remember doing this uh, flexibility test. You have to put your feet in this machine and lean forward. I maxed out the fucking machine. Like where the line is, my hands went past that. So my flexibility was through the roof when I was doing a lot of bar back squats. Ass the grass, deep repetition. This will build up the flexibility in your hips, your hamstrings, your ankles, everything. If anything, you wanna do more squats for that purpose. So I don't know who's telling you this. To me, it's the opposite, okay? And just look at Olympic weightlifters, like I said. So I would encourage you to do squats and more specifically box squats because this will benefit you most as a combat athlete. Box squats will break up the eccentric concentric chain and therefore build explosiveness, okay? And you can also calibrate the positioning to make it more specific to your sport, okay? So you don't have to ask the grass, all right? You can go slightly below parallel and you're gonna be fine in that regard, okay? And also this will teach you how to sit back, okay? And you might feel your posterior chain uh, a bit more, which is always great for fighters. So I'd recommend box squats, conventional deadlifts, and even Jefferson deadlifts, okay? The Jeffersons are out of this world because when you're fighting, it's one leg in front of the other. So Jeffersons will help you out in that regard. They're great for wrestlers as well. So those would be some go-tos. And then uh, for some other accessories, you can throw in some unilateral work, like lunges, okay? And I'd even advise you to do some sled pulls and all that. And also make sure to train your neck really hard. So there's a lot of things I could recommend. Like I can make a whole video on this subject, but... Try out those for now and you should be good. And in, in terms of the programming itself, I'd recommend concurrent periodization because as a fighter, you gotta be strong, you gotta be explosive, you gotta have the volume, you gotta have it all at the same time, right? So concurrent will take care of you in all respects. On oh, one final thing, do your box jumps. Hello, Alex, can I get defined upper legs with cycling? Thank you. Well, I would more so say that people who do cycling are going to be leaner. So it's not, it's not necessarily the exercise itself that's sculpting their legs and bringing out the striations and all that. It's more so the fact that people who do cycling need to be a lower body weight and therefore they will be defined. Now that said, if you're doing a lot of it, it can build up the VMO quite nicely, okay? And you might get some, some muscle right around the knee area so when you flex, when you're doing those nice leg posing, you're gonna see all the musculature being exposed, all the definition, okay? There are some guys who, they may not have the best hamstring development or the best outer quad sweep, but they got that VMO down, you know? And they got the cuts in the legs and all that. And again, it's not because of spot fat reduction, it's just, you're targeting a specific part here, okay, combined with the leanness. So I would say do it, but don't expect anything magical. I've heard a lot of people say that when using conjugate concurrent, you need to be doing the main lifts, whatever those are for you, every week on either day. Why don't you do this? No, that's not true whatsoever, okay? In fact, Louis Simmons never does a conventional lift at his gym. He never pulls from the ground, like the competition style that is, okay? He recommends variations every single time, which automatically raises it. Now you could train like that, but it's not required. So you can hit some comp bench as your secondary movement, or you could do it once a month on a max effort or something, or you could do it in waves in terms of volume training, but that's not a requirement, okay? You can use similar variations which will automatically get you stronger, okay? Like close grip bench, close grip bench with a pause, camber bar bench. As long as the movement is very specific to the competition lift, it will yield carryover and you're gonna get stronger automatically, okay? Especially if you're addressing your muscular weaknesses. So if you have a weak chest and you're doing a lot of bottom work, well, that's going to help you out, okay? So it's not a requirement. It really isn't. That's bullshit. You can pull off mats. You can do deficit pulls. You can do stiff leg. You can do all kinds of different styles. And then when you go to your conventional, it's going to be much higher than it was before without even practicing the lift, okay? You can go months without doing the competition lifts, okay? So it's up to you. If you want to include it, go ahead. But it's definitely not a requirement. Like for me, I'm always rotating variations. I'll do dead bench, close grip dead bench, a little bit higher than that. Then I might do some close grip benching with a pause. 
you know? So I, I always mix it up, slingshot bench. The thing that I do the least is actually the competition bench. Regular style, so regular grip, pausing for a few seconds, come back up, that's the least thing that I do, real talk. Most of the time, it's a variation that's even harder than the classical lift. And for me, it was mainly dead benching in 2018, okay? So no, it's not a requirement. Again, you could train like that, but you don't have to. Sup, Alex? I have this insane pain in my hip while squatting and deadlifting. Sometimes the pain goes down to the groin area. I have the pain while walking as well. Man, I don't know what it could be. Um, maybe you have a hernia. Maybe you have some serious flexibility issues. I would personally recommend that you consult a professional because I have to admit that the subject of mobility and these little injury things, not my area of expertise. So maybe consult a guy like John Quint, you know, or find a professional in your area. I don't know what to say. I don't know what's going on. I really don't. But I do want to help you nonetheless. And I think it's better that instead of coming up to a YouTuber, right, you go see someone in the real world who can assess what's actually going on. So if you're having pain on everything, pain from walking, pain from squats, pain from deadlifts, what else are you going to get pain on? And what's that going to transcend into? So this could actually be a serious thing. You might be injured. You might have something that's going to get much worse. So you got to get that assessed ASAP, my friend. Hey, Alex, I have decent looking front and back, but when I look at my sides, it seems like I don't even lift what's going on. Maybe you have some good lats, okay? So from the back, when you do your spread, you look pretty good, but you got no upper back thickness. So when you turn sideways, you can't see the traps, right? That makes a big difference when you're sideways, or you can't see the upper back popping out necessarily, which is a key facet in looking big. It could also be that you have nice chest, nice biceps, so you see that when you're in the front, but you got no triceps, especially the long head. So when you turn sideways, there's no mass there. It could also be that you got stick for legs. So overall, when you turn sideways, it's like there's no mass. More specifically, it could be the hamstrings. It could be the hamstrings and the glutes, which you don't really see unless you're taking full body shots yourself. But I would say there's a few lagging muscle groups that are likely playing a role here. My guess is that it's the hamstrings and the glutes, the upper back and traps, and then the long head, the triceps. So I would focus on those. Hello, master. Do you think supersetting 5x5 program, example, overhead press and pull-ups is a good idea? I think it's a great idea. Why not? Those movements pair really well. Push-pull, what do you want me to say? It's time-tested and it, it just works well. It really, really does. Especially those two movements, overhead press and pull-up. It's like similar movement patterns, but just the opposite. Okay, so it complements nicely. And I don't see this being difficult necessarily. So you're in the power rack already. You do a set of overhead press. Then you jump straight into the weight of pull-ups. Then you rest a little bit. Perfect. Fucking perfect. Which combo has the most care over your bench in your opinion? Weighted dips and standing overhead press or weighted dips and seated? I will alternate between both, obviously, but which is bang for your buck? Honestly, I don't think there'd be a significant difference between the two. Now, I like the idea that you're incorporating both, but if you're doing that, maybe in a concurrent type setup, here's what I would recommend. Weighted dip, standing overhead press, okay? With a pause. Then your second wave, you do weighted dip with a pause, then seated, overhead press, touch and go. I think if you pair it that way, you'll make even better gains. And I can give you more samples too. Post another question if you want me to get more into detail, but that's how I like to play around with it. I like to modify the variables a little bit. So if you pair it this way, you'll like it, trust me. Hey Alex, what are your thoughts on mewing? Okay, I've been getting a lot of questions about this. So my opinion is that I don't know if it works for adults, okay? I've seen some transformations online and the effects are marginal at best. And most of the times it's actually a change in lighting or change in angles or people are flexing their face to make it appear that way. I'm not convinced that it works, guys, for adults, fully grown adults. Now, if you're a teenager, I think it does work in that case because your face is not fully done building and all that. So I think it's a good idea to do nonetheless, okay? You don't want to be a mouth breather, so breathe through your nose and mewing can certainly help with that. But this idea that it's going to somehow turn you into a supermodel, which I don't think that's what it's claiming, but... The notion that you can get the super sculpted face by doing that as an adult, I'm not, I'm not too sure about that because I've seen guys who've been doing it for like five, six months straight, even combined with the fucking gum. So they're buying hard gum, they're doing the mewing. I'm not seeing crazy changes. And when there is a change, usually um, they grow out some facial hair a little bit to give some definition or they just worked on their neck a lot or they got stupid lean. So I'm going to say that is a far more practical thing to do. Get your neck as wide as you possibly can. Grow out a little bit of stubble, okay? And lose some body fat. If you get to a low body fat, you're going to have the jawline. You're going to see everything popping out. Like, I don't have the greatest features of myself, okay? But when I've been stupid, stupid lean, you can definitely see the effects, okay? So even if you're not blessed, you can still work with what you got. And I'm going to say being lean and building up the neck is the most important thing you can do. So should you mew? 
Yeah, why not? Especially if you're a teenager. Even if you're an adult, you should be doing it. Why not? It's good to get that proper tongue posture in check. Okay? Go ahead. If it helps a little bit, fantastic. Great. If it takes years, if it takes a long time, fantastic. But as of right now, from what I've seen, I'm not convinced that it's delivering what people are claiming. Okay? In adults specifically. Okay? So, I don't know. What are your thoughts on it? Do you have experience with it? Can you show me some real before and afters of yourself maybe? A real before and after. Like, show me a 30-year-old that did mewing for a year, who has the same weight, same body fat, maybe the same neck size, who has improvements. I'm not seeing it that much. So I don't know. You, you let me know. If it actually does work, I wouldn't mind promoting it. I think it would tie in very well to the natural enhanced philosophy with all the illusion strategies, if it actually works. But as of right now, I'm not convinced, okay? That said, it is important for the proper tongue posture and all that. I feel like I can't squeeze my ass, quads, and core all at the same time. It's one or nothing with me. Help. Well, let me try that out. So for me, I could do it no problem. Um, so I don't know, maybe you got a my must connection problem. I have no fucking idea, bro. All I could say is that this shouldn't be a main concern, okay? If using proper form on your compound movements, those areas will all grow just fine, okay? Especially on a maximized routine where you're doing more than one lift. So if you're doing squats and deadlifts, plus you're hitting a little bit of accessories, all those muscle groups that you just mentioned will build. No question about it. In fact, just doing squats alone, We'll build it all, okay? So if you got a 135 squat, you take that to 500 pounds, which is an extreme goal. But just for example here, you don't think your quads, hammies, and glutes are going to get bigger? Of course they will. So I advise to keep focusing on your squat. Focus on raising that strength and use proper form. Once you use proper form, all the correct muscle groups will develop. And if you have certain weaknesses that you notice are popping up, like maybe your hamstrings are starting to lag a little bit, okay, you up the RDL volume, you up the leg curls, okay? But I would say... This is not really a major issue if you're using proper form and you're inducing progressive overload. So focus on the strength first and see what happens. Why is there hardly any direct bicep isolation in your naturally enhanced program? Well, the forearm section is very complete and there are many, many, many curls in there. So I don't know what you're talking about in regards to biceps, unless you're referring to like direct, direct in the sense that we're specifically trying to build a bias. Okay. The objective of naturally enhanced is to raise your general strength in the exercises that build your neck, traps, upper back, shoulders, forearms, and glutes. It is a specialization system. It focuses on those six essential muscles. All the other muscles, it's indirect how you get it bigger, okay? Which includes the quads, which includes the triceps as well, which you're trying to get better at because it raises your compound movements and all that, but it's not, the main goal is not to build your tries and the main goal is not to build your bars either. So a lot of that stuff is indirect. We're only concerned about the six essential muscle groups, using the illusion strategies, raising our general strength, and that's about it, okay? Higher body fat too, that tends to be pretty beneficial, but it's not an absolute requirement, if you will. So it's about the six essential muscles. Now, if you want to do more standard curls, be my guest. I didn't include those in the system because this is a specialization program. When I used to have the alpha body system, it was the opposite of naturally enhanced. It focused on the VMO, the calves, the biceps, the upper chest. It was literally the opposite muscle groups, the long hair, the tries. You know what I'm saying? So the system is to build those six essential muscle groups. But if you want to calibrate it to include more bodybuilding curls, go ahead. I chose the forearm specific curls from the arm wrestling world and the grip strength world because that's what it's designed to do. My program will get you very jacked in those six essential muscle groups. Okay, we got two questions from this guy. I'm just going to answer it straight. One, would you recommend rack pull shrugs and direct neck training the same workout session? Yes, I absolutely would. Uh, although neck training could be done on your off days if you choose to. That's what I usually do. And usually what I recommend as well. But if you have the extra time, if you want to do it, fine. You can do it all if you want. You can do rack pull, shrug, row, and direct neck work. All of it. No problem. Secondly, would you describe one of your intensity days and one of your volume days? Sets, reps, exercise. Okay. You can check out my full body playlist. I've demonstrated some of the workouts, okay? So those will give you some samples. If you want more information on that, you can check out my naturally enhanced program, which includes 13 programs that you can run, okay? Three of which are brand new and they're very basic and simple to follow, okay? And it shows you all the instructions, how to approach your sets and reps, how to rotate exercises. Everything is explained in the book, okay? So if you want a greater example, you could read that. By the way, I'm really glad I found your channel. One or two weeks following your advice from the videos and my dad told me I look bigger. I guess it's not by accident. It isn't by accident, man. You're following good advice designed for real naturals and you're focusing on the yoke for the first time in your life. 
<laughs> two weeks is nothing, let me tell you. After about a month, you're going to see your next one get even bigger. Two months, three months. Think about what happens after a year, okay? I've been getting a lot of neck training testimonials recently. People are coming out. They're like, hey, Alex, neck training is fucking legit. Had a bunch of guys send me their before and afters, 14 to 17 inches. Very common stuff. We're seeing it over and over again. They're going to keep coming. And you're next. In fact, I want you to send me your before and after. In the neck in particular, because I know it's going to go up. With all this direct work, with all the specialized yoke training, it's going to go up. So with your traps, upper back, everything, okay? So I'm more than happy to help you out. I thank you for your question. And keep me updated, homie. Hey, Alex, what's your take on Olympic lifts? My take is that they're very good, but unnecessary for general strength and bodybuilding. It's a very specific niche, and you have to use very good form. And personally, I don't do them whatsoever, okay? And I don't care about them either. Now, if that's your cup of tea, if that's what you like, go ahead and do them. They're awesome. I'm not going to talk trash about Olympic lifts. They're really, really good, but most people... Don't need them. Most people won't be doing them. And if you do want to incorporate Olympic lifts, you better hire a coach so that the form is on point. So that's my take on it. Best way to get really strong at pull-ups when you can only do about two to three at a time, don't have equipment, okay? Yeah, same for dips. Do them every single day with a little bit of repetitions. So you can do two to three reps in one set. Perfect. That's all you need. How about you do one pull-up every hour, okay? So if you're awake for 15 hours, you're going to be done with 15 pull-ups a day. Think about what that does by the end of the week. It adds up. You're getting that workload in and you will get stronger at the pull-ups. So use the lowest amount of volume that still allows you to recover. Again, see my video on high volume push-ups and pull-ups, okay? And again, the same strategy will be done for the dips. If you can only do about 10, do maybe four or five every hour or whenever you feel like it or do one pull-up every minute. So you don't have to go crazy doing it one set burning yourself out. Try greasing the groove. Slowly add the repetitions. You're going to see you'll make all kinds of gains. Alex, I'm a 19-year-old male with low testosterone, 131 nanograms per deciliter. Any tips you can give me? I'm not saying newbie gains most beginners should have. I've not been injured by lifting and I get in healthy fast in my diet. Okay, you have really, really, really low testosterone to the point where I would even tell you to get on TRT, okay? Which is very unfortunate given your age, but this is fucked up. This is not normal whatsoever. I don't know what happened. I don't know how this occurred. I don't know if it's due to the environment. I don't know if it's a genetic problem. I don't know if it's because of nutrition. I don't know what it could be, but this is excessively low. I would say you have the levels of a 90-year-old male, okay? This is not a youthful testosterone level. This is very, very low, okay? So you're definitely going to need to see a medical professional. If, 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 you, if you got this fucking number back, you got some blood work done, and the doctor didn't recommend anything, I don't know. Like, I'm not a medical professional, but that's fucked up to me. This is way too low. And explains why you're not making gains. I wouldn't blame you. I wouldn't blame the programming. I wouldn't blame nutrition. This is definitely a hormone problem. Okay. And you got to get that fixed out ASAP. So do what you got to do. Consult a professional. But this ain't normal, my man. Why do we need connective tissue work? Why the concurrent periodization isn't enough? How many times per week? And last question, why only with bands? Great questions. Okay. So first of all, it's not 100% mandatory, but it's really, really, really recommended because it will only enhance recovery. It will only do you good. And I believe in maximized programming, okay? If there's something that you could do which makes your recovery better, your muscle gains better, your strength gains better, why wouldn't you include it? It's like these guys who don't do rear delt work or mobility stuff. Why wouldn't you do it? The little extra is what makes all the difference. And the connective tissue work will get rid of joint pain. It'll speed up the recovery process. It'll make you so much better as a lifter. I'm telling you, you have to try it out. Do the band pushdowns, the band curls, okay? the band face pulls. Do all that stuff. I'm telling you, you will notice a difference. So it's not 100% necessary, but it is really recommended. And you're going to want to do it two to four times a week. I recommend 12 to 24 hours after each workout. And then last question, why only the bands? Because of the overspeed eccentrics, okay? And that's the best way to hypertrophy the connective tissue. You could look into John Quint. He talks about this a lot and he references a super training, okay? So the overspeed eccentrics is really what's going to build the connective tissue. It's the very fast repetitions. So yeah, last question of the week, homies. What do you think of super high volume calf raises to get rid of chicken legs? I think that's the way to do it, man. High volume with pausing. So pause at the bottom, hold it there for a few seconds, come back up, flex at the top, okay? Use very good form, use very high volume. Do seated calf raise and standing calf raise. And if there are other variations you could do, like the donkey calf or raise, one-legged calf raise, go ahead. And calves can be done very frequently. I would say every 48 hours is probably best. So train them every other day. Induce progressive overload. Use high volume, whatever allows you to recover. And watch those calves grow. They will build. If you give them time to grow, if you put in that work, they will grow. It's not a genetic problem. 
It's that you're not hitting them with the effort that's required to let them grow. Okay, so that's what you got to do, man. Stupid high volume, pausing, stretching, all that. You're going to be just fine. And try nucleus overload as well. I recommend uh, one-legged calf raises every single day. So try that out. And with that said, we are done with this Q&A. I thought it was incredible. One of the best of 2019 so far. Put some more questions down below. And I'll see you all next week.